Well, Bing has become the voice of Christmas, uh, I suppose in part because uh, he's has so many Christmas albums and so many songs associated with him and all of those television shows. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Because of Bing, every pop singer of his generation and after had to do a Christmas album. Everyone. Well, I think he was the most appealing man I've ever met, but he didn't know it. And that's part of it, that's, that's important to not be aware of how adorable you are. He had those big blue eyes. The thing about him, much people don't realize, is that uh, uh, he studies hard, he works really hard to get to a point of where it's absolutely uh, an afterthought. It's, it's natural, and that's part of his style, is uh, he's got a quiet energy about him. And I think that's what's made so much of what he's done very effective. All American singers were influenced to one degree or another by Bing Crosby. He was, I would use the word, seminal. Well, the line I always quote is uh, Artie Shaw said to me when I interviewed him. He said, the first thing you have to understand about Bing Crosby is he was the first hip white person born in the United States. Uh, he was the guy who understood black music. He was the guy who had no racial hang-ups at all. He was incredibly ahead of the curve on civil rights. Famous jazz musician asked me years ago, he said, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm just starting a book about Bing. And he said, oh, man, I want to read that. I said, really, you're, you're into Bing Crosby? And he said, where do you think we got the songs from? I think Bing Crosby um, is representative of America at a particular time over many years. I think that he attained a level of importance that very few entertainers, in quotation marks, achieve. If, if you were in New York, sir, you'd have to pay 660 or even 880 to see the, uh, hear a great singer like Captain Wallace, sir. I'm well aware of Captain Wallace's capabilities. But he grew up in Spokane, Washington, right by Gonzaga and the church and Christmas was very important in their lives. They didn't have much money, but they had singing, and they had music, and they cared for each other a lot. Hi, I'm Stephanie Plowman, Crosby curator here at Gonzaga University. Welcome to Crosby Alumni House, boyhood home to Bing Crosby. Well, Bing Crosby's dad had this house built in 1913. Previously, his uh, family had been renting a house a couple blocks away, and they moved here once the house was built. Well, right out the back door uh, is one block away is Gonzaga University, and this house is exactly where uh, Bing Crosby's dad built it. Uh, Gonzaga ended up buying the house in 1980 to make it the Alumni Association. But what can I imagine Bing leaving out the back door as he was singing on his way to campus to attend school with his brothers? The Gonzaga uh education stayed with him forever. It's going my way is very interesting to me because people look at it and they say, oh, it's so sentimental. But it wasn't for Crosby and Leo McCary. They thought it was autobiographical. <laughs> they said, this is, what, this is where we grew up. This is when juvenile delinquents stole turkeys. They didn't kill old ladies. He remained, he remained a, a son of Gonzaga, a non-graduate, but a son. So in May 2003, when Catherine Crosby was here, we had a chance to really get to know her and just, she would talk to us about how important Gonzaga University in Spokane was to Bing before he died. And so we're happy that we're able to continue his memory here on Gonzaga's campus. Crosby had an ability to sort of reflect the period uh, as American history changed over some 30 years. No other singer uh, had the impact or reflected the feeling of hope and confidence and optimism that he did. He could sing anything, which was unusual. But I think after the, uh, his late 20s, his early 30s, you know, he realized that he had a tiger by the tail. And so um, uh, he was disciplined in his, in his approach, in his work ethic, and he got serious. You know, the power of uh, the importance of White Christmas in Crosby's career is, is most obviously illustrated by the fact that it's his number one selling record. Uh, it plays, it's the lead song in two of his most important movies. It animates his radio show forever, every year. It becomes something that the whole country waits for. And then the same thing happens when he switches the show to television. Where the treetops 
lips glisten and children listen to hear sleigh bells in the snow. Bing became extremely uh, involved with the war and was extremely moved by the, the whole idea of the citizen army, as I think most Americans were. Going through his correspondence from that period, it is amazing how many letters, I would say in the thousands, not the hundreds, uh, came from uh, widows, mothers, sisters, servicemen killed, who wrote him saying, you know, how much he loved you and the last thing we talked about, or he wrote a letter, or how grateful they were for the recordings you sent. The troops were very, very conscious of being at all times. They were getting his radio broadcast, they were getting the V-disc, they were getting the free records. Almost many people knew someone who knew someone who actually got a letter from him. If you wrote him a letter, you got a response. They joined the Hollywood caravan that was doing train uh, trips all around the country. They gave the best work they ever had. They gave to this country. He raised millions of dollars uh, in bonds, and he was really willing to do anything toward, toward that purpose. He made any number of short films, did all these charity bouts. And I want you to know something, Davis. Anytime I can do anything for you, anytime, any place, you, you just pick up a phone, huh? Uh, thank you, sir. They did V-discs for the first time in, to, in response to General Douglas MacArthur, who said, please sing for our boys that are trapped in Corregidor. And he did. And he said, if I never do anything else, I'll always take pleasure and satisfaction in knowing that I helped some of our troops relax for a few moments. He was so modest, that's all he ever said. White Christmas was, was requested everywhere he went and by everyone he sang to. He had a hard time in the hospitals. He really was very tender-hearted. But he always did it for them. And they always cried. In some respect, Bing Crosby became sort of, maybe only after FDR, uh, the symbolic American. I think that White Christmas was the summation of Bing Crosby up to that point. If you look at the film, it is very hard to look at it without looking at Crosby. It doesn't matter that Danny Kaye was a marvelous performer, Rosemary Clooney was, was wonderful, uh, Vera Ellen. Crosby dominates the film. Well, meeting Bing was, everybody wants to know how I met him. How did you meet this man? He was royalty. I mean, he was the biggest thing in Hollywood. I had just signed a seven-year contract with Paramount Pictures. My mother and I flew out on a Sunday, and on Monday I was taken to Paramount Pictures, and Wednesday I tested with Bill Holden, and by Friday I'd signed this seven-year contract. So one day I was walking back to the, uh, to the wardrobe department, carrying petticoats over my shoulder, and I had a tennis racket in my hand, and it had the brace on. And then I heard this voice saying, Hotty Tex, what's your hurry? Well, I dropped the brace and it put a, there's a scar right here on my knee. And, and, and uh, it was just amazing to hear that voice. He was kind of hypnotic. You'd hear the voice and you'd just stop. And you'll fall asleep Counting your blessings because he sang and spoke in the same voice. Later on, he told me he was doing White Christmas. And shortly thereafter, I started a column with some Texas newspapers, Texas Gal in Hollywood. And they said, who do you want to interview? And I said, well, Bing Crosby would be very nice. And so I went over there looking all dressed up. And there he was in his military garb and he absolutely mesmerized me and everybody else that was around. He was lovely. Well, hello. What's doing? I couldn't sleep. Oh, well, you're a little young for that route, aren't you? I think Crow Bing Crosby's connection to Christmas derives from two things, two aspects. One is White Christmas. 
easily the song. It is played constantly throughout that season. But the other thing, I think, was the Christmas show at the time. He had a show every year at Christmas time, and you saw the family growing up, and you saw something behind the song, and that was that this really meant something to him, and it was something that drew the family together, and I think it drew people together. And it's really only in recent years that you, you kind of look back and you see that it's all the same person, and also how important those Christmas songs were, because we forget, but we were at war again. It wasn't the same kind of war, but we were in Vietnam, and a lot of those people at home got a lot of the same kind of feeling of security and togetherness from watching Crosby and his wife and his children coming out and sort of bringing the country together again in, again, what was primarily a secular celebration of Christmas. It was an annual event for us to, to be in a Christmas show and it was so much a part of our education. I was just going to Los Angeles to watch my dad rehearse the Hollywood Palace. Uh, it was a live show. Uh, it was uh, directed by a guy named Bill Harback. As my father was rehearsing, um, Bill came over and said, uh, do, you, do you sing at all? Kind of jokingly. And I sang this little ditty, which uh, they said, all right, he's on. And, uh, and that was it. And that uh, was the was the, the seed, the embryo of the, of the Christmas shows as, as uh, was remembered. So the next year, uh, the whole family came down, uh, and then it was an annual event. And at the end of every one of the Christmas shows, of course, White Christmas was, was, uh, was sung, and Dad would do the first verse, and then the whole family would come out and, and sing along the Christmas, and finish the tune. I think Crosby has never been given the credit that he truly deserves for expressing in that song that feeling that we want to be one, you know, one group, one whole, one community, one nation, one society, one culture, one world. He had total integrity. He was always ready. He was always early. He had great respect for the workmen, uh, the prop men, the... Uh, uh, the grips, the light men, all of those people that work so hard and very few people appreciate them. Well, he did. He changed everything. Uh, Sinatra was influenced by him. Presley, my God, Presley covered him some, something like 35 times. Uh, a lot of the early rock singers, they, they grew up listening to him. The Beatles, Please, Please Please Me is, is their a play on uh, Crosby's old 1932 record, Please. And uh, they say that, uh, I've been told by a number of people that John Lennon had a jukebox at the Dakota, which only had Crosby records on it. So, you know, people who knew, knew. I, I hope his music uh, stays in people's minds forever. Uh, I think there's so, first of all, there's so much content out there. Uh, uh, and it's not just Christmas, uh, songs it's not just white christmas and i hope that that that, uh, that people can see him uh, as a person who was really diverse in his interests and in his passions um, uh, but had uh, a great gift of music and and of acting and and i hope that content stays alive and may all your christmas be white 